So we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Christy Williams. I'm our Senior Marketing Manager and I will be moderating today's discussion with Sean Farrell, our CEO. And so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. So please go ahead and use that to ask any questions throughout and we'll try to get to them during the presentation or at the end. And if we don't, we'll make sure to follow up via email. Uh, so without further ado, then I'll turn it over to Sean and we'll dive into some fun stuff around Azure. All right, thank you, Christy. Um, hopefully I'm coming in loud and clear. So okay, I'm gonna stop my video just for bandwidth to make sure we're all good, but I'll let you okay. go. Good deal. So welcome to the uh, the webinar. We're going to go through today a little bit about Microsoft Azure. And I, you know, we threw in here Microsoft Azure 2020, sort of an intro. Um, a lot of people know what it is. I'm sure most of the people from what we saw in the invites, you know, typical, we have a lot of CIOs, CTOs, and a lot of IT management. So you're probably very familiar. So what I was going to try to do is sort of bridge that gap between the business some of the new stuff happening in Azure, and then ultimately just make sure that we all understand sort of where Azure all fits um, and maybe even talk a little bit about the competitive landscape. So hopefully that's what you want. And as you'll see in my uh, intro in a second, it's gonna say at the top, ask questions, and it's gonna say at the bottom, please ask questions. And you know, I, it's very hard to do a presentation on something that has so many different components to it, or as they call it in the cloud, microservices. So anyway. Um, with that, we are one of the largest Microsoft service providers here in the US. And all that means is that, you know, when it comes to Azure and it comes to Teams and SharePoint and Microsoft, that is really where we're focused alongside of, as you see in the slide, which has got a lot of data, um, other partners, of course, but just a lot of integration, a lot of strategy and architecture work. And then of course, you know, we do ongoing services for companies to help with sort of that help desk and outsourcing, especially with COVID. But um, over on the right, if you guys are thinking about things like power apps from Microsoft or the power platform or looking at teams and teams with voice or looking at Azure, things like that, that's really, you know, where we hit it um, well. So again, here's what we're gonna talk about, you know, questions, what is Azure intro? level overview, you know, Azure goes beyond just hosted data. I, I got to say it's, it's been an interesting topic over the last bunch of years. You know, people tend to want to get a price for Azure and, you know, compare it to something on premise or in what I'll call a private cloud. And, you know, that's just not the, the best way in our opinion to do it. So we'll talk about it. Um, services in Azure, sort of, if you're using Microsoft Office 365, or as they call it now, uh, Microsoft 365, you know, we're pretty much on our way to Azure. And, and as much as some people go, ooh, Microsoft, can't believe they're doing that to me, or others who go, wow, it actually is well integrated. You know, it's, it's got a good opportunity for a lot of organizations. We'll talk about cost benefit, TCO a little bit, planning migration, data management. I mean, how do we get there? What are the tools? You know, some you probably know about, some you may not. Security, BI, machine learning, AI automation. And then of course, questions, just ask them throughout. All right, so here's the reason, or I guess the triggers, and you guys are probably all feeling it out there that might say, or might make you say, hey, I need to move to the cloud. So I won't go through this slide, but I'll just say that what we're seeing right now in the industry specific to why people are looking at the cloud is typically business intelligence, trying to aggregate data, companies looking at aggregating data into a modern cloud or modern you know, public cloud like Azure, and then ultimately getting the BI out of it, but ultimately doing that with some, what I'll call security on the back end to meet whether it be compliance regulations, you know, NIST, GDPR, um, you know, California, you know, the new Privacy Act that just came out, that's why people are looking at it. And my only piece of advice here, um, scaling, a lot of acquisitions, M&A going on in this very weird time, but my point is, is that as we look to the cloud, I think there has to be some business outcome in mind aside from just potentially cost savings. Although we'll talk about that later, you know, these are the things that are really moving, you know, people into Azure and what it can do, but um, good lay of the land. So the real, I guess we call it the modern estate for your company's data. And I guess if you think about Azure, you think about your data center, you think about maybe your private cloud that you have, wherever that may be, if it's not in your data center, you know, that's just what I would consider, you know, your estate. It's like your home and you have to figure out how to build it well. And so most companies, 
that we're seeing right now were built in a hybrid cloud, regardless of if they're using Azure, AWS, Google, their own private cloud on premise, they are in some form of hybrid cloud or they're leveraging SaaS applications or platforms as a service from the vendor, whether you're using Salesforce or you know, some other third party tool. So with that said, that's just kind of the norm nowadays. And what people are trying to figure out is, you know, how do I build that private cloud? You know, who do I leverage in more of the public cloud space? And then really, what is that? How do I say, how do I continue to build my home long term into potentially a public cloud as more services become available? So that's what companies are thinking about. Um, and as you see on here, we talk at the bottom about some of the different platforms available to you if you're an app company developing an app. Um, some of the backend security features that come out of this, and let me see if I can get this out of the way, um, which include, you know, things like built-in security and compliance features that sit behind those apps to do things. But those are strategies that, that CTOs are trying to figure out right now. How do I build sort of the outside from in, you know, sort of protect my castle wall security strategy while building a cloud within that, and then inside of that, keeping my people more productive. Um, it's difficult to do. It's a, it's a big strategy and something that, you know, we always look at when we're looking at the Azure and or any cloud platform we're working with customers on. Christy, any questions so far? No, no? Oops, sorry, I was muted. Not yet, but I'm okay. wondering. So if anyone has any, feel free to chime in. Okay. So, oops. So I was just going to quickly show you guys Azure regions, just so everybody knows in comparison to its two largest or um, I would say competitors, Azure is by far the largest cloud provider in the world. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. Um, what Azure can do, and again, um, we could call it microservices or we could just talk about it in more general terms. And again, for this webinar, I didn't want to get too deep, but Azure can be anything from, you know, moving infrastructure or virtual machines, whether it be VMware, Hyper-V, you know, some form of Linux, oops, into the cloud. And so ultimately it can be your compute, it can be your networking, it can ultimately be your storage platform for what we call backup and site recovery. Um, it can also be your mobility platform for things like, you know, mobile device, I'm sorry, mobile app management or app management for a mobile phone. It is obviously a platform as a service with SQL. Oop, keeps doing that. I don't know why they set this up like this. Sorry, I'll keep going back. Um, where you can build containers and databases. But the biggest thing that we're seeing within our cloud platforms that customers are moving into is they're looking for AI, business intelligence, you know, machine learning, all of the above. And we'll talk a little bit more about monitoring and management in Azure Stack in a few minutes. But again, really cool tools that help you from a security perspective. So the funny thing about it is that, and again, 85% of companies are actually already in Office 365. So what I mean by that, and as we're now calling it Microsoft 365, most companies have made the transition to move at least email, if not now using things like Teams or SharePoint to the Office 365 or Microsoft 365 cloud. So one of the things that some organizations understand and others may not is that once you've moved and you've created a tenant inside of Office 365, you've really created a tenant inside of Microsoft Azure. So in a lot of ways, you're already what I'll call authenticated or you know, your identities are set up in Azure. And with a few extra steps, for example, you know, connecting Azure Active Directory to your Active Directory on premise, you ultimately are kind of hooked into Microsoft's Azure platform. And then from there, as we talk about things like you know, SSO and federated services, you know, we can connect to any platform, like we said earlier, Salesforce or some third party software or Oracle with you know, our Azure Active Directory credentials or our identities as if it were from Azure. And so very important to think about, it is in my opinion, one, and again, it's just an opinion. One of the highlights of what Microsoft has done is that, you know, you sort of got yourself into Office 365, which again is a great tool or Microsoft 365. And Azure just kind of inherently comes along with the process. So Something to think about um, as you're looking at Azure, as you're looking at other what I'll call SSO tools and security tools. And it's just something to think about as you guys really investigate whether we want to get infrastructure platform or some form of software as a service built inside of Azure. So question, Sean, if yeah. you want to utilize Azure, um, is the first step migrating to Office 365 if you're not already on there or 
it sounds like they're asking, you know, what if you yeah. want to look at different, different clouds or? Yeah, so the, the short answer is no on Office 365. The, the key elements is what I called it earlier, is called the tenant. So in Azure, you could go without having Office 365 and have, you know, let's say traditional email like Exchange on premise and your Office Docs on premise, or you could even have, let's say, Google Docs on premise. But if you were going to look at Azure, you would want to what's called spin up a tenant on behalf of your organization. Pretty straightforward to do. And then from there, as we'll talk about later in this, there's some TCO strategies, migration strategies, and really ways to look at sort of doing pilots and proof of concepts in Azure. And the same goes for other platforms like AWS and GCP from Google. Um, but Azure is really all about the tenant and getting that spun up and you don't have to have Office 365. That is just sort of the precursor in a lot of cases with Office 365 that kind of gets you into Azure, but you don't have to have it. Great, thank you. Yeah. So I thought this kind of what we talked about in the last slide is a simple way to just think about identity and the concept that everybody's talking about that hopefully we're all already doing, single sign-on, federation or federated services. And so, you know, when you think about your Active Directory, we pretty much all have it today on premise or in the internet. Um, ultimately, I'm sorry, or through the internet, we all have it and we all have identities. Microsoft through Office 365 offers up, you know, four or five different types of what I'll call synchronization services, federation services, or even sort of your Azure Active Directory, sort of the mirrored copy of AD in the cloud. And a lot of people are reading, well, do I get rid of my Active Directory on premise? And my short answer is, is depending on if you have third party applications that reside on premise still, that's one question to ask yourself. Number two is, you know, the internet connection potentially gets, I guess, severed. Um, you know, you still want to have control of the identity on premise. But my point be it here is that once we've got Active Directory sync through one of these synchronization tools, and by the way, most of them come with your Office 365 suite. So if we're looking at products like Okta, OneLogin, Ping, and other sort of call it SSO or authentication tools, we may already have it built into Office 365. Once we've established that link, whether it be through a VPN tunnel or you know, an express route as they're calling it, which has you know, been around for a long time now within Azure, we're also hooked into other third party applications and we just left it simple up here and said, you know, your SaaS applications, like I said before, Salesforce, um, Adobe, whatever it might be outside of the cloud. And by the way, what people don't also know is that Microsoft itself within Azure has created all these connectors into your third party applications. Um, I think there's over 300,000 now, where if you have licensing that you buy through like a Salesforce, you can automatically hook it into Azure and as soon as you provision a new user in an automated or what we call an auto enrollment process through Microsoft Azure, that user gets all those applications, that license is pulled down from quote unquote the vendor, whoever that may be, and everything is automated for the user. So really cool things that they're doing with Azure. And we could talk later about some of those tools with Windows Autopilot and auto enrollment, but that's all again, stuff hooked into Azure. So, I wanted to bring this up because a lot of the people on the phone and a lot of questions come up these days about databases and SQL and, you know, do I look at AWS? Do I look at Azure? And really a lot of the companies who are larger in size that we get to deal with have the traditional enterprise agreement. So for the people I think on the phone today, from what I saw, you probably have a long-term licensing agreement with Microsoft. If you don't, you're probably buying under what's called CSP. But the point of this all is here is that, if you have not taken advantage or don't understand what's called the Azure hybrid benefit, it's something that you should be looking into as a customer. And so ultimately what the hybrid benefit is, is in a simple way to say it, is if you were to buy into Microsoft Azure and then SQL within Azure, so your databases on the Azure cloud, you can also come back and use the licensing that you're using in the cloud and put it onto your on-premise servers and give yourself sort of what they call the hybrid benefit. There's a long story to that, but it is a cost saving exercise. And when you compare it to having to have SQL licenses for Microsoft and then buy into the SQL platforms within like an AWS or a GCP, it's significantly more expensive to run your applications in Amazon. And again, we do both Amazon and Microsoft, but that's just something that customers are still trying to grasp their, um, 
head around is how do I do this hybrid benefit stuff? And, and we just wanted to show a little bit about that today. Any questions, Christy? No, but that sounds like it's good for, you know, people who want to keep something on premise due to compliance reasons or otherwise. Yeah, older applications, older databases required. Um, I would say, you know, that's a primary reason for doing that. And ultimately, you know, maybe you're doing development on premise, but SQL is, as a database, can be very expensive. So people are always trying to figure out how to make sure they get the best uh, cost for what they're using. So I wanted to move a little bit into what I'll call the traditional or the hybrid cloud model, but really Azure Stack, for a lot of you guys who haven't heard of it, um, Azure Stack is, in the, in the best way to put it, is Microsoft's way to leverage your on-premise data center or leverage your private cloud or your co-location or wherever you host your data today and put infrastructure in there that you own, you purchase, whether you purchase it through Dell or another authorized vendor, and you can be connected up into Azure um, data center with these Azure Stack products, okay? So we're seeing a lot of that right now in market. Um, the question comes up, you know, I don't wanna move fully into Azure. I also have to retire some of my infrastructure. So what we're seeing a lot of people do is sort of build out these Azure Stack. And it's again, it's a whole software platform in the back end that controls the, what I'll call authentication, the replication of your VMs up to Azure. But again, you still have control of your stuff on premise. Um, you know, say it's VMware in your private cloud through Azure Stack. So something to think about, but it definitely gives you an option for Azure if you don't have traditional on-premise infrastructure or if you're trying to get out from under on-premise infrastructure and you wanna sort of have a better tie into Azure. And again, because of today's short session, we don't wanna go too far into it, but if you haven't read about it, please do and, and let us know if you have any questions. Come on, next slide. There we go. So th three steps, wait, did I, there we go. Sorry guys, three steps to consider before migrating to Azure. Um, and this is an important slide. So we're getting a lot of questions in market about Microsoft Azure and you know, we're getting a lot of companies saying to us, here's my current footprint as far as data center goes. Here's the provider, VMware or Microsoft or Citrix or whatever it might be. And ultimately, here's the current spec from CPU, RAM, storage. And when we get those things from customers, you know, one, it makes us very nervous, but two, you know, it's very hard to really understand your total cost of ownership and your pricing in Azure if you truly don't go out and what I'll call understand the real heartbeat of your data center. And to do that, you know, most companies have different tools that they use to pull specs within their data center, whether it be SCOM from Microsoft Assistant Center or they're using, you know, Terrace or they're using some other product. But the key to understanding what you're actually using in your data center is really understanding, like I mentioned, the heartbeat of what's going on. You know, how much average CPU are you using in the data center or on your, for that application? How much storage do you really need? How much time has it been since you've accessed certain, you know, volumes of storage inside of those servers? Because we don't want to price our clouds, meaning not managed solution, not Microsoft, such that we're doing apples to apples per se, based upon a server spec or a virtual machine spec. So needless to say, understand the footprint there, understand your current EA or other Microsoft spend too. You know, what your SQL licenses look like, you know, what the cost is, um, and then look at some of the other, you know, Azure app service tools that we use, which again, uh, if you haven't used Azure App Service or Azure Migration Center tools, App Service tools are cost estimators and ultimately uh, a tools that run on your data center. You can plug them in through Active Directory or you can plug them in through, you know, a local admin, you know, computer, and they'll go out and they'll get you that harpy we're talking about. So um, there's what's called App Azure Rapid Assessment Tool. Um, there's Azure Migrate Tools. But again, use these tools to understand the footprint of your data center. Um, you know, understand your real costs. I, I think, again, we're seeing a lot of, here's what I got today, here's what I wanna look at in Azure, AWS or, or Google. And, you know, what we're trying to understand with companies is, you know, really the holistic approach to everything. And one of the things we talk about a lot is data management. So a lot of the time we go in and we look at a server and then the database that's running on that server or the virtual machine, and ultimately the application that's sitting on it. And what we find 
is that there's certain things, whether it be the application um, that's, you know, taxing the server or, you know, there's a, a stuff where we're seeing data that's not been touched in a bunch of years. And all of a sudden we're asking the customer, hey, do we really need all this data and these subsets or these volumes and could we move it to potentially a, a very inexpensive storage option if we go to Azure versus putting it on a highly available machine. So really digging into that and understanding the data management component is key. And then from there, you know, really understanding how to optimize infrastructure, just like we talked about with data management, understanding that we want to get the current rate that CPU runs at, storage runs at, and allow our data centers in Azure to auto scale. And again, there's some art to that, but ultimately it's really about getting it right. And then of course, um, you know, easier management. So one of the things that customers are thinking about as they even look at cloud. And again, it's a total opinion on my side, but you know, people are familiar with Microsoft tools. People have built, as we talked about earlier, their tenants, so to speak, in Office 365 or Microsoft 365. So really, we're already in that Microsoft Azure world. And whoever is running the admin side of the tenant portal for Office 365 or Azure, you've seen a lot of the tools and how easy they are to move through. So what we're also seeing with Microsoft as a, just a holistic approach to doing technology is that they're building platforms uh, such as power apps or the power platform, you know, web apps and web parts that allow our traditional systems engineers and network engineers to become sort of these, you know, citizen developers if they have any background in things like PowerShell and all that. And so Microsoft, in my opinion, is not coming at it so uh, much from what, you know, traditional developer side is building an app, but more so our traditional business side with our systems admins and network admins trying to really get, you know, a way to easily manage tools across all their platforms. And then what's interesting if you read about what's happening in Azure is that the security that sits on the back end is far and above, um, you know, better than what we've seen in most platforms. So when you start thinking about Microsoft Security Center, as they used to call it, and now it being called Azure Security Center, people want to understand how to just build in, you know, through that Active Directory, connected into Azure Security Center, rights and ways to control data loss and ways to understand, you know, uh, information protection or, you know, advanced threat protection, but all controlled through the Azure console or the Azure Security Center um, within Azure, just through an identity. A couple of questions come in, yeah. Sean. Um, so someone asked, they're curious um, as to how seamlessly Azure works alongside AWS, specifically if a platform is leveraging AWS and a client uses Azure for their data management and requests SSO capabilities. Yeah, well, there's two answers. Because So on the SSO side, it's really up to you what tools you use. A lot of people, you know, if you're an AWS shopper using Okta, um, or one login, you know, a lot of the VMware tools or, you know, one login. But again, on the SSO side, we can use Azure AD or Azure Active Directory and they're inherently with Office 365 um, or Active Directory Premium as they call it, or we can use the Okta tools and we can authenticate through our identity platform, regardless of what that is into either cloud. And then between the clouds, Oh, uh, long story, but the short is, is that there's a lot of tools from Azure Site Recovery to Azure Batch to AWS Batch services that allow us to move data between AWS and Azure, including even doing things like, you know, containerizing applications if we want to do that and move them between, you know, clouds. So I guess the short answer to that is it can be done. We have actually a lot of schools who exist in both AWS and Azure. And we just for sake of, you know, what the school asks, we want to replicate data between and then store it in each cloud. What is it, uh, EC2 and, uh, I'm sorry, Glacier and Amazon and then Blob Storage and Microsoft. We do a lot of that for customers. Awesome, thanks. And then the other question is, um, how disruptive is it to integrate the cloud into their current system? And I mean, from what I know and understand is like the, Azure migrate and those other assessment tools do a really good job to see what your dependencies are and how different applications are going to react. So it's a great way to test. But Sean, I'll let you add to that because you're more technical than I am. So on their, I assume on their current system, meaning if they're in AWS today? 
Uh, they didn't say, but I guess just, you know, maybe whether they're on premise or in a different cloud, what is, I guess, that process like? And I know we could probably do a whole presentation yeah. about that. But it, I think I think the short of it is, is that, you know, people are really getting wrapped around. I want to, you know, look at multi, multi cloud models and, you know, public cloud models. And I think to answer that question specific at the end of the day, every human being who works in our organization has an identity and that's typically governed by Active Directory. And so we got to start with that, you know, the federation tools. And like we mentioned a few minutes ago, whatever it might be, Okta or AD, Azure AD or, um, you know, one login or ping, we have to get those things interconnected to those tenants inside of those public clouds. And at that point, the migration tools, the services, all those things are there for our, you know, call it systems administrators, systems admins to move data in between. So again, I actually think that topic really revolves around the identity management piece and security piece of this, but interconnecting clouds has become quite easy. Um, moving databases, moving, you know, applications, all of the above. And the tools are there, like I said, with Azure Batch or ASR, Azure Site Recovery, and some of the other, you know, migration tools. And with that, you know, there's, uh, Microsoft does give managed solution money. And again, this is my only, I guess, I was asked to do this sort of plug for the day. So in a lot of cases, people looking at Azure, and if they are, and they fall within what I'll call the right size, Microsoft will pay us to go out and go through, um, you know, sort of that design and assessment phase for companies and sort of spin up those pilots and proof of concepts, you know, spin up tenants, help companies understand the underworkings of underlying workings of Azure. But again, that's where we can come into companies and do these things like design, discovery design and architecture sessions. Oops. And then that meant they, somebody put it in there, but it's meant to say rapid assessment tools. I can't say enough as bad as that spelling is you have, you have to run an assessment tool in your on-premise environment to get a good for, uh, idea of what should move into Azure or frankly, any cloud for that matter. If you're asking your current provider, um, say you have an outsourced partner that you work with or you're working with your internal team, they need to be running these tools to really understand the footprint that exists um, on your data center today. Like I mentioned in the last slide, you know, what's really happening? What does that heartbeat look like? And then figure out what it needs to look like in Azure. Another question come in, Sean. Sure. Um, this is an interesting kind of use case that uh, I think you'll be able to ask, answer. So they have Microsoft 365 Share, SharePoint on cloud, and they have Microsoft SQL Server 2019 local. They want to access their SQL tables from their cloud SharePoint, and there seems to be a quote gateway that needs to be set up, but the documentation is miserable and it's not working. Is this typical of Azure? Or do you have any advice for this person? Well, no, yeah, yes. I'll answer the yes to the typical of the documentation. And yes, you, so you have modern SharePoint running, it sounds like. So we've got it into our M365 or Azure platform. But it sounds like we're just trying to have, we have issues with the SQL database on premise. Um, so two options. One is um, if they want, Christy, happy to do a call, have them chat with one of our SQL experts on just how that works. I guess the second option is, um, I'm just trying to think of a way to give you the answer over the phone. The second option is, is I guess we have some documentation on how that works as well. So we could get it over to them, but probably a quick phone call would help them understand how to interconnect those databases so they can have that hybrid enrollment. Now, the other thing to consider in doing that is look at the hybrid benefit if you don't already have it in place, um, if you're gonna continue to run SQL on premise, because that database that's running SharePoint in your modern SharePoint environment is sitting on SQL. So there might be something there for you too to think about. I, I don't know the lay of the land, but I'm just, you know, high yeah, level. Yeah, those questions are sometimes tough to answer when yeah. we have the visibility. So I just shot over my email. And if you'd like to send me an email, we can set something up um, with someone on the technical side who could, who could better answer that for you in more specific detail. Yeah. Um, so with that said, you know, we talked a little bit about this, you know, Microsoft, again, um, it's, they have security center, you know, built in security on the back end. I'll show you that in just a second. The admin center for people who have used Microsoft 365. It's, it's very familiar across all three platforms. And when I say all three, Azure, M3, Office 365, M365, and even their security, Azure Security Center, which, you know, for a lot of people out there, they think about enterprise 
mobility and security or EMS, which has became enterprise management and security, which is really, I think, if you really look upstream into Azure and how it all works, when you really get automated, it's all about you know, how we use Azure Security Center with some of the tools that we use as part of our Microsoft 365 platform. Um, integrated back of a disaster recovery, we talked about that, you know, that's from things like Azure Blob Storage to, you know, Azure Data Lake. If you haven't seen it and you don't understand it, I feel um, it, it's just some amazing products to understand how to better manage data from a storage capacity. Anyway, um, you know, on the application and the app dev side, things have just gotten way, way better with Microsoft where they work across all platforms and their GitHub repository has been incredible to watch sort of evolve. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the stuff that they've been doing, you know, I would say this coming from this space in Microsoft and working with Amazon, the one thing I can say is that there's a lot of expertise out there. There's a lot of training we get. Um, and so it's nice because, you know, we keep up with the current times of what's going on. So last but not least, um, I wanted to talk about the security platform and just, again, give you a high level of what it is. So Mike, everybody knows that M365 or Microsoft 365 was Microsoft's take on sort of your Office 365 productivity suite. So the Teams, the SharePoint, all the good stuff within you know, Word and Excel and PowerPoint and of course email. And then you had the EMS security side of Microsoft, which people have still to this day been trying to figure out what does it mean? How does it all work? And as I best describe it to people, it's sort of two ways to look at security. How do we protect the castle walls from the outside? You know, the advanced threat protections, the information protections, and then how do we protect our users from the inside from doing you know, bad things or opening up the wrong things? So things like MFA and things like um, self-service password reset data loss prevention, rights management. And with all that said, people are getting, and I would say I'm confused sometimes too, very confused because everything has now sort of an Azure MFA on top of it or an Azure um, in information protection or an Azure advanced threat protection. And I think if you're really diving into the Azure conversation, what you're starting to see is that all of these tools are built right here into Microsoft Azure. And the goal is an administrator or a systems engineer is to get to the point where my Active Directory can work with my Active Directory within Azure or maybe no Active Directory on premise and really control identity and pushing and pulling of security policies down to our devices in a very automated way. So I won't go too far into how that's done. I just would say to you that if you do it right with Azure, you should be able to allow your users to auto enroll as they call it, just like kind of buying like a cell phone, you put in your credentials and bam, there's all your applications. And by the way, behind that, it's all your security and policy, your rights management and your data loss prevention. But that's really, again, where Microsoft's done a fantastic job of building out tools in the back end that the other providers unfortunately don't have. So you're sort of bolting on other things and it's easier to manage through one centralized platform. And you know that's a real example right there of what you see. But the other thing I wanted to mention real quick too was if you're looking at SIEM tools for your organization, you know, if you haven't looked at Azure Sentinel, by all means do. And just like it sounds, it's sort of out there pulling and ingesting data and information into the environment in Azure to understand where you have vulnerabilities. You know, you have to mitigate threats, do vigilance. If you haven't understood or looked at site recovery, it sounds like a backup strategy solution, but Azure site recovery is really the answer to sort of moving data sets or VMs and all that between your on-premise data center and the cloud. Um, if you haven't actually taken a look at sort of the new functionality in Azure AD and their MFA tools, um, an MFA multi-factor authentication is rapidly changing as people are starting to feel like, you know, people can clone your cell phone. And so maybe the only thing we can multi-factor authenticate in is through our actual device that we hold on to this, this laptop or through, you know, some sort of biometric. So the point is, they're doing new things with different options, which makes their MFA product, in my opinion, after seeing a lot of them now, pretty amazing compared to some of the others. And then another thing for sort of, you know, uh, we'll call it cloud app security, if you're familiar with it, but really looking at your applications um, through Azure. Azure has an asset inventory tool now where you can go in, look at the applications, kind of the shadow IT thing, and be able to see what those apps are doing and how to build security around you know, many, many, many third-party apps. So 
really cool stuff that they continue to push out that's just really integrated, again, if you do it right, inside of your Office 365 platform. So um, next steps, like I said, you know, you, if you're looking at Azure, and I, I truly mean this, I, I'm, I've gotten to the point where I don't mean to be ornery with customers, but I really don't want to see the Excel file with, here's what I got today, give me a, sc a scope. I really want to say to them, hey, if we can get monies from Microsoft or we can help you with a total cost of ownership breakdown by just doing a little investigation, you know, do that first. And in a lot of cases, you know, Microsoft does fund some of these things. Um, from there, you know, you want to work on designing that network topology. Uh, you know, we're dealing with carriers all the time and you know, how routes work back to Azure on the networking side. We're seeing a lot of things with application vendors and making sure the performance is going to be there. Um, we're dealing with a lot of what's called Windows Virtual Desktop, as they call it, sort of the new way to have a virtual desktop through Microsoft. And so, you know, we have to understand what that user needs from a, a, a you know, CPU and memory um, perspective. So understanding how those applications, how the security strategy is going to work, the governance, and then how to migrate you know, those users over, it's key. And so we do a lot of that. And then again, start your migration projects. And we said earlier, somebody asked the question, there's a ton of tools that we can show you how to use, we use. Um, you know, once we get you potentially a past stage two there, we can hand it over to you guys to do the migrations. But you know, if we can help you, and we do a lot of this with Microsoft, you know, we'll get you some funded engagements with them and to work with our Microsoft team to you know, get some stuff off the ground. Um, and again, I always believe in the five P's. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. So meaning prepare, it's key. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, so as Sean said, um, the first step to qualifying for that funding is, is being here today. So we can talk about that. Um, if you're interested, what that means for you to kind of help you get kick-started with an Azure migration. Um, we also have tons of tools available. We can set up a rapid assessment or look at Azure Migrate. It's um, a pretty minimal project and there isn't any disruption on your, your end. It's really just a matter of installing agents on current machines and seeing how they perform or react. And you know what's really cool about this stuff is you can play around with it to toggle it to make sure that you know, if you're worried most about cost, well, let's find the most budget friendly approach. If you're worried most about performance, let's find the best performing approach. So we can really tailor this to you. Um, and then there's also a very cool calculator that we can go through and look at a total cost of ownership and really break that down from all the different kinds of applications that you're using today. And then what would go away if you were to migrate and, you know, put all your, um, marbles into the Azure cloud and you know what that looks like. So we can do some really granular detailed reports and preparation to make sure and confirm that this is the right move for you and your business um, and answer any questions ahead of time before we dive in. So yeah. I'll send an email out with the recording, with all this information um, and I appreciate everyone's engagement today. It doesn't look like there's any more questions. So Sean, if you have anything to add no, I think that's it. I again, I just would say that I can't pri I can't say enough about that prep phase, really getting the understanding of what the architecture is going to look like. Um, it's it's just using what's called the Azure Cost Calculator, and you know, throwing an Excel file from your data center, that kind of stuff. It it just doesn't work. Um, and I feel I feel guilty when customers send that to us and say, "Can you give us a cost comparison?" Because I just know that really we got to dive deeper into, you know, that heartbeat. Um, the other thing that, you know, I get asked a lot, and I'll just leave it at this. People ask me all the time, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. And, my, and I actually have a slide that I didn't throw up here, but I'll back up a little bit. So I think the di big difference is that Amazon looks at everything. And again, I love Amazon, by the way. Um, but Amazon looks at everything as from the application and the development side of the house, meaning you know, we want to understand what the application is, the platform, and developers have just fallen in love with Amazon just, you know, because they've been around in the cloud for some time. And of course, they have a lot of brand rec recognition in the market. You know, with Azure, I think the big thing that we're seeing is that we're used to using productivity tools from Microsoft, Office, Outlook, Excel, 
um, PowerPoint. And again, they're great tools. There's nothing out on the market, even with Google Docs that really compares. And Amazon doesn't have a quote unquote productivity software. So Microsoft sees the world through the lens of the user, the experience and tools they already know as we say here. So as we said earlier, when you have Office 365 and you have your tenant already exists in Azure and your people who work in IT understand it already, how it all works, it makes not only the cohesiveness of the platform, but the management of the platform that much easier. And that's why, and I hate to give you the, the cost thing and less expensive overall when you look at management of IT. Again, total opinion, but that's what we're seeing. And then GCP, they're known to be the least expensive in market, but Google is really after the whole side of, you know, use our technology, sorry, use our devices, use our Google Docs platform, and then ultimately use the Google platform the challenge we see there is that user adoption of their docs platform, unless you grew up with it in you know, school or you know, in something in a prior company, it is a different world for a lot of organizations. So with that, you know, I would say look at all of them, but um, you know, everyone's got their sweet spot in the way they do business. And you know, we're just yeah. trying to figure out how to follow them. I'm glad you brought that up too, Sean, because with the shift in the way of the world these days and so many businesses remote, the user experience is so important. You know, you're onboarding new employees or you're trying to get employees more productive and efficient and, you know, not have any roadblocks with their technology to make sure that they're still productive at home. And, yeah. you know, it was a big challenge in the beginning of all this and we're seeing more and more companies adopt to the cloud and, you know, make those changes. So if you're one of those companies that needs help, we're here and we'll send more information via email, but we appreciate you joining us today and have a great Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks everyone.